Hi everybody, uh, this is a bit of an honour, thank you very much. I want to start um, by dedicating this lecture to my late husband, Howard Liddell. He was uh, an architecture student here in Edinburgh, and when he died, he was planning a book. And that book was called Ecomax, and it was about eco-pioneers, about his heroes, people who had influenced him in his professional life, and one of those was Ian McCall. And I have been doing a lecture series in Howard's memory, uh, year on year, with the Scottish Ecological Design Association, of which this forms a part. But to the main man, um, Ian McHarg was a Scottish landscape architect and writer on regional planning using natural systems. He was born in Clydebank near Glasgow in 1920 and went on to found the Department of Landscape Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania in the United States. Ian McHarg, along with Rachel Carson and Barry Commoner, brought ecology into mainstream thinking. McHarg's 1969 book, Design with Nature, pioneered the concept of ecological planning. It was the first work of its kind to define the problems of modern development and present a process for achieving compatible solutions. It also laid the foundation for environmental impact assessment and regenerative design. McCart's defining characteristic was his colourful language. He had an enviable talent for insult. He called out bad developers as vandals and accused them of rape and pillage. He defined highway engineers as persons who, if struck with a blow with a four pound hammer on one ear, could not transmit a reverberation through to the other ear audible with a stethoscope. <laughs> he took no prisoners and he made few friends from corporate America, but he was hugely influential. As we currently stand, with oceanic pollution and climate change and biodiversity loss, it is difficult to argue with his view of mankind. Blind, witless, lowbrow, anthropocentric clods who inflict lesions upon the earth. He wrote his autobiography in 1996, and it describes his obsession, and that was the environment. It delivers some special insights into his beliefs and his sense of awe. He considered the universe to be improbable and miraculous, and recognised that all creatures evolved from the same origin and contain the entire history of life. We are made from the ashes of the stars. He was aware of the Gaia hypothesis, which in the 1970s defined the Earth as a single interacting organism and considered that it could be a basis for a new understanding of nature and ecology, theology, economics, work, and a new approach to adaptation, planning, and design. He believed that although mankind had long been engaged in despoliation of the Earth, that the increased capacity to destroy would make us aware of our actions and would create change. He also believed that awareness of global warming would introduce a constructive debate about how we treat the environment. We shall see. He opens his autobiography at age 11, in the depth of the depression and what he calls the fulcrum. Behind his house, open countryside, a beautiful, powerful landscape, now the start of the long distance path, the West Highland Way. To the front, the smokestacks, Clyde Cranes, and Mills of Glasgow. Tenements with no street trees, parks, or redemption. Grim, urban squalor, poverty, and despair. This view of the city was to permeate his life's work. He credits his mother for his love of nature and gardening, but the church was the centre of his father's life, and McCart became a committed Christian. However, it was with the creation story in Genesis that at the age of 16, 
His attitude to Christianity came unstuck and set him on a path to ecology. He totally rejected the notion that we should be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Nonetheless, he remained a Christian throughout his life. But he describes himself as having found his spirituality by the sea and in the mountains and he maintained a lifetime respect for other religions. Clearly he was a very accomplished student, he was talented in painting and he was a keen reader and writer. It was a careers advisor who proposed that he study a landscape architecture, a subject of which he was self-confessed ignorant. After a trip to Perthshire with his prospective employer, he was apprenticed. Like many of his age, with Christian belief in pacifism, he nonetheless volunteered for military service, influenced by the barbarity of Mussolini and Hitler. He had not completed college, and he was known as the art student, and was therefore singled out for the most unpleasant tasks, which he describes in vivid detail. He sought advancement by volunteering and excelling into every opportunity, and achieved eight promotions to become Major McCormick. His contribution as a landscape architect up to this point was a military cemetery in Athens. On being demobbed, he made a decision to study landscape architecture at Harvard, to which end, being completely unqualified, he wrote to the head of architecture school, Walter Gropius, to inform them of the imminent arrival of Major McCarg to study on the postgraduate program. <laughs> on arrival, they did not reject him, but they did require him to pass a year of preliminary exams. At Harvard, Major McCarg simultaneously took a master's in landscape architecture, largely gardens for the rich, which he called cookie cutting, and in other in city planning, as well as numerous undergraduate programs. We know cookie cutting. On graduation, he returned to Scotland to take up a post as assistant planning officer. Planning was located in the Department of Health, and McCall considered this an inspired location. He put it down to the influence and legacy of Geddes, the Scottish sociologist and planner. Disease, he said, apart from aging, is a consequence of planning. He then had a period of severe ill health and spent a torturous time in hospital in Gustafin before escaping to a Swiss sanatorium on a grant for retired parachutists, which just shows you never know when your luck is going to come in. He put it down to the influence and legacy of Gettys, uh, sorry, um, this confirmed his desire for a career in design and place making for human health and well being. He found professional life in Scotland far from gratifying, and he bemoaned the lack of cooperation between those ministries with an influence on planning energy, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, food and mining, traffic, transportation, housing, and commerce. He noted that the area not subject to planning, preservation of agricultural land, was indeed its greatest success. He recognised the value of retaining the then excellent public transport infrastructure of trams and trains and buses, but it was clearly a minority view. He understood the theory of induced capacity that means new highways will become saturated and was influential in preventing creation of some new roads, including the one up the east side of Mock Lomond, which I think we're all grateful is not there. It was an interesting time with large sort of clearance in pursuit of improved public health, but he had begun to realise that the emerging problems were metropolitan, not urban. He despised that housing was undertaken with dogma and stencil, no intelligence, little skill, and without landscape architecture participation. He became a critic of modernism, not on principle style, but because 
He believed it missed the point. He thought the measure of architecture was its ability to enhance human health and well-being. I think there are people in the room who very much share that view. He argued that the low-rise multiple family housing offered better opportunities at densities akin to traditional village life and able to sustain services. Houses facing onto greens with cars at the back. This is in fact the contemporary urban ecology model. As no money was allocated to housing, he himself undertook research into the cost of open space. He identified it as a modest packet of cigarettes per family per week, which I think is a marvellous, if somewhat outdated, unit. He taught landscape architecture here and in Glasgow for three years, three years, and during this time he was invited to investigate Cumbernauld as a site for new town. His research led him to conclude it was a miserable place, wetter than most, intractable mud, poor sour soil, a high water table, few trees, and those wind pruned. A comparison followed in which he described how Greek colonists and city builders found defensible locations adjacent to good agricultural land. They grazed animals, some of which were slaughtered after a year, and they were examined for deformities, that is, the availability of nutrients, but also the existence of toxins, a sophistication, I would say, beyond the 1950s and now. In Scotland, the housing rules were very simple, no steep slopes or prior agricultural land. Beyond that, anything could be considered. Macau noted that the slopes had not prevented growth in Rome, Siena, Frascati, San Francisco, and on. He investigated alternatives, and he developed a proposal for four-storey housing equivalent to the traditional four-storey tenement. Stepping down the steep slope, the roof, flat roof of one house, a terrace and balcony for the housing above. It provided economies of construction and energy saving from Earth shelter at 40 dwellings per acre. Its rejection on the grounds that it was so revolutionary that even the English hadn't done it was the last straw. He considered the low level of discourse, the lack of passion and inactivity, and he wrote to a friend in the US inquiring about any professional opportunities. By return, he received an invitation to develop a department of landscape architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. It was 1954, and he was a very happy man. Macau described himself as ludicrously unprepared to become a founder and chair of a new department. I suspect that was the cause of his success. He decided to start by attracting qualified architects to do postgraduate study in landscape architecture. With eight students from across the globe, staffed by visiting professorships of distinction, the first five years were spent in bringing together the best practice to solve conspicuous social problems, with students working on real issues. He was by all accounts an exceptional teacher, and many of his students took forward his ecological planning approach. He then started to identify some concerns with the lack of engagement on the part of the intellectual leaders in architecture and planning with the environment, but also with the lack of consultation with inhabitants. On reflection, he realised there had been no mention of the environment throughout his own education, and addressing that took him the next five years. Macau defined a fit environment as one in which the greatest number of needs of a user are provided as found, where the least work of adaptation is required. This transposes Darwin's survival of the fittest into the far less aggressive survival of the most fitting, and fits with contemporary research that for any species, the least time spent hunting and keeping warm, the more time and energy for pleasure and procreation. Selection of the best environment, ecological planning, was therefore the human equivalent of adaptation. He evolved a method by which important factors could be appraised as good, neutral, or bad. 
These locations are the most positive and the least negative would be the most fit environments because it requires less work and adaptation than any other. McCarg went on to advocate that natural processes that perform valuable functions be recognised and maintained in the urban fabric. He also proposed that observing rules about land unsuitable for development in the interest of health, safety and welfare would naturally allow a continuous and productive system of open space to permeate metropolitan areas. This was the start of the layer cake approach, which he went on to develop to huge impact. I want to show you another example of the layer cake approach. In this case, route selection. It was 1966 and McCart was asked to discover an ecologically sensitive alternative to the route of the I-95 across the Delaware River. He had six weeks to study 600 square metres. He set out in search of a route that was least cost and maximum benefit. At the, at the time, highway design looked at slope, property, ownership and land value only. McCarg extended this to climate, geology, hydrology, soils, vegetation, wildlife, and community consultation. Then interpreted each for implications for an interstate highway with the least social cost. Fog, snowdrift, ice, and inversions, their presence was a cost and their absence a benefit. Bedrock and superficial geology for foundation costs and costs of excavation. Slopes, the greater the slope, the greater the cut and sell costs. Water, the cost of streams and river crossings. Surface drainage, the cost of degrading water, water from road-related pollution, from road salts, effluent and heavy metals. And he added to this scenic quality, wildlife habitat, recreation and land values. Each was interpreted in shades of grey. The greater the cost, the darker the grey. These were superimposed. Each group was allowed to include or exclude a particular factor and could use a number of the same slide to provide additional weight. So, for example, the historic preservationists could heavily weight their area of concern. No change there. A clear best option formed to research cost, a fraction of the highway research budget, and the ecologically, socially responsible alternative was also the cheapest. This was the beginning of environmental impact assessment, and digitizing the data was the beginning of computerized ecological planning. He went on to develop the method to embrace most disciplines, but there were never enough. He was particularly proud to introduce inter interdisciplinary teams in an applied professional programme, not a science department. He always saw ecology as the underpinning and chronology, the link. The layer cake method was used in numerous ecological planning studies, often with the students acting as staff to the task force and having a significant influence on national policy. He didn't ever concede to cities. His studies of the pathology of cities are astonishing. He used his layer cake to map density, alcoholism, homicide, drugs, infant mortality, tuberculosis, and salmonella in the interest of finding out more about improving public health and well-being. These days, one would have to add a number of different aspects to that as well. In 1959, and some would consider this to also be a significant achievement, he initiated a course in Man and the Environment with globally important guest speakers on the scientific concepts of matter, life and mankind. Major philosophies and uh, religions and the attraction of man and nature. It was radical because at that time the environment was not a topic. There were conservationists but no environmentalists. He educated himself alongside his students. It became the most popular course on campus, led to a CBS TV programme and was a source of the material in Design of Nature. 
He also revisited his rejection of Genesis and invited numerous theologians to debate it, concluding that no one had identified any survival value in subduing the earth.